Listen, any joke I could have made about this character has been done to death. So why don't we just put a knife in that idea and move on? And you know, I would have been able to finish the script faster if Yuri didn't steal my pen. Oh well, at least she wrote a nice poem with it. Oh, Yuri, that's, uh, so good. Yeah, I love it, Yuri. But you know what I love more than this poem? That's right, analyzing your psyche and showing these lovely people why you might do the things that you do. <sighs> and you. Hey, you look nice today. I'm Juice, and welcome to my character analysis of Yuri, the melancholic maiden of mystery herself. And what a mystery she is, but we love that for her. Let's open our third eye together. And as always, I'll be showing art of the character made by members of my Discord server, which you're welcome to join, by the way. And while you're down there looking for the link, you might as well subscribe. <laughs> that is, of course, if you want more character analyses and DDLC content. Ooh, I know. Let me set the atmosphere real quick. Yuri loves that. Hey, you did subscribe, right? Right? It's evident in the way she overthinks every decision when talking to people, double checks to make sure what she said is even okay, and in her constant fear that she's gonna somehow end up ruining everything for herself anyway. It's shown multiple times in the game, and she even outright tells us in a few instances. But first, I want to try pinpointing where that comes from. What's the source? We don't actually know too much about Yuri's past in detail, unfortunately. Goodness, Dan Salvato, better get cracking on that DDLC anime everyone keeps asking for. We want more of these characters. <laughs> Just kidding, of course it's not that simple. Well, we do have this to go off of at least. In the side story, Reflection, from DDLC+, Monica finds Yuri by herself during lunch. This occurs the day after an argument in the club arised. I think anyone would like you if they had the chance to get to know you. Well, unfortunately, the opposite is true. That's why I'm not talkative anymore in the first place. Because everyone used to think I was weird, and talk about me behind my back. That's just what happens when I draw attention to myself. Natsuki even said she found it more respectable when people speak their mind, so I did. And then she hated me anyway. That was enough to confirm my fears. You saw none of that. And so, we see that Yuri's social anxiety likely stems from this. Her trying to talk to other people about her interests, those people thinking she was weird for them and then making fun of her behind her back, thus making her overthink everything she says in social situations to prevent that from happening. We don't know exactly when this all occurred, but I can only assume it was throughout middle school when she was more into manga. Almost like she's reflecting off Natsuki. Eh? Eh? But let's be honest, middle school is much more horrifying than anything Yuri could be reading. <laughs> this must have been a reoccurring thing over the years. It would be super unlikely if something like this only happened once. Negative thought patterns are just that, patterns. They're hard to break free from and become stronger over time. So all these behaviors only serve to reinforce themselves. Social anxiety can be hereditary too, but research usually shows that when children and their parents share the same anxious behaviors, they do so because it's a learned behavior, not necessarily a gene that's passed down. That being said, we don't know anything about Yuri's home life at all. An interesting fact though is that social anxiety typically sets in in early teens. That would back up the fact that these behaviors likely started around middle school with everything we've been presented with. Now that we have a good idea of where her anxiety originates from, why don't we go into the game and see some examples. I think we can all see the general stuff, like the way she hesitates when she speaks, or how she nervously plays with her hair. Honestly, a lot of her body language just reeks of anxious energy in general. But I want to show some more direct examples first, and then go into what problems this might be causing. Yuri's anxiety is causing her to hide her true feelings in most interactions. She's putting up a mask and burrowing what she usually wants to say almost constantly. Which of course causes problems when it comes to processing those emotions later. Everyone does this to an extent, but the more you do it, the more pressure you put on yourself, and so the cycle continues. When you can't process those emotions, sudden outbursts of them are common. Not only that, but unhealthy coping mechanisms develop in order to try to deal with them because of how hard they can be to regulate on your own. We'll get into those coping mechanisms a little bit later. We see a few times where those outbursts happen, like when Monica goes up to Yuri and the protagonist during the main game and asks where they're off to. They say that they're going to fill up the water pitcher, and Monica said that she was just wondering since that's more of a one-person job. 
Kind of passive aggressive, but also not too big a deal. Yuri responds by saying, Monica, please mind your business for once. Or do you want to tell me there's something wrong with helping involve the protagonist in club activities? Monica and the protagonist are both shocked, but Monica ends up responding, saying that there's nothing wrong with that. This outburst likely comes from the fact that Yuri was too anxious to bring up when Monica was being too nosy for her in other points in time, because she was afraid of something going wrong or losing that friendship like she's used to. But when she couldn't hold it in anymore, along with whatever else was happening in her mind, this happened. And she said the things she wanted to say in a way that she wasn't very happy with. Right after they leave the classroom to fill up the water pitcher, Yuri puts her forehead against the wall and says, I spoke without thinking. How could I say something like that? Even now, she's being too hard on herself. She's playing everything up in her head. It was the biggest mistake of her life. And the protagonist says it best when he says, Your mind turns a light rain shower into a hurricane. Wow. Even turning it into a metaphor for her. Sly writing, Salvato. Sly writing. Also, Yuri asks if he would hate her for doing what she did. But the protagonist says no. He would never hate her for having emotions. What kind of friend does that? Yuri gets really bashful when he says that. Surprised that he considers her a friend. And says that she likes being friends with him. That's pretty much the closest it gets when it comes to proving my points about how her old friends do this. And how she ended up this way in the first place. You know, making fun of her behind her back and whatnot. That's probably the reason why it hurts her so much to see that happening to Natsuki in the self-love side story. When Natsuki and Yuri are discussing Natsuki's friends outside of the literature club. Natsuki says that they can't take anything seriously and that their attitudes get on her nerves. She used to be good at putting up with it because she thinks it would just be stupid to cause drama over a joke she didn't like, but lately it's been bugging her more and more. Yuri says that she doesn't like people who want to hurt her, that she doesn't like that people tease her for fun, but Natsuki says, well that's why I'm friends with them and you're not. But when Yuri asks, you like it? We get an indirect answer from her, telling Yuri not to worry about her so much. I think that Yuri is able to detect Natsuki's discomfort because she went through the same things herself, but dealt with them differently. If you want to hear more about our cupcake queen Natsuki and how she feels, then you should go watch my Natsuki character analysis once you're finished with this one. Don't disappoint her! Another important moment that happens between these two is when Natsuki eventually ends up cutting ties with her friends and she experiences a panic attack. Yuri is able to comfort her through it by placing her hands on Natsuki's shoulders and saying that everything will be alright. This helps ground Natsuki back to reality, lowering her guard and allowing Yuri to help her process her emotions. Yuri even says she has experience with panic attacks. And that's why she knew exactly what to do. Sometimes our bodies can react to anxiety before our brains even catch up to it. That's why it can be important for people who suffer from anxiety to develop grounding techniques, which helps them through those attacks or feelings of heightened anxiety. Another example of her anxiety and tendencies to bottle up her own feelings come from when she first joined the literature club in the side story, Understanding. She was enthralled by a book, alone in a classroom, where Monica and Sayori found her. Monica ended up entering the room and tried talking to Yuri, but she never answered. So she just left a pamphlet on Yuri's desk and walked out. She was super embarrassed by it, but Yuri is the one who felt even more embarrassed, taking days to build up the courage to go to the literature club because she was afraid people would think she's rude or stupid for not knowing what to say or looking up from her book. That's the social anxiety coming through strong. After initial introductions, Sayori and Yuri started reading a fantasy novel. Sayori is intimidated by it, but decides to give it a try for a chance of getting to know Yuri better. She tends to ask a lot of questions, and mentions that Yuri will have to be patient, but she ends up asking less questions over time out of the fear of looking stupid. When they're done, Yuri asks what Sayori thinks of the book, but Sayori just asks if she's doing well so far. She explains that it takes her so long to understand things, but that she likes how into it Yuri gets, and that makes her want to keep going, but Yuri's relaxation fades and says that they can do something else tomorrow. Sorry, I don't want to do this anymore. That's all. I'm sorry that I made you. The next day, Yuri is sitting outside of the club room, afraid to go in. Monica catches her outside a little later, and eventually gets Yuri to spill what's going on inside that thunderstorm brain of hers. She's seemingly certain that Sayori isn't into the book they're reading, and she's stupid for forcing it onto her, and that she feels like she's an inconvenience just for talking about it. She says that she's a really weird and awkward person, and that she's accepted that about herself, but that she doesn't understand how people can connect with each other so easily. She's used to being ignored or made fun of, or people taking pity on her when she's confronted with new social situations. It's because of that she's convinced Sayori is taking pity on her. 
She says that she just wants to be treated like a normal person. Whatever that is. I hate the concept of a normal person. Monica says that she should communicate her feelings to Sayori because making people feel happy is the most important thing to her. And that if she's able to explain how she feels, then she'll do what she needs to make that happen. Everyone has their own needs. And Yuri shouldn't feel like she's the only one with them in a friendship. No one should feel like that, no matter the relationship. Yuri starts saying she's not good at communication, but then cuts herself off. Her head is so resistant to everything. Everything. She's tired of the cycle she's creating for herself. And she's pushing such a kind person away because of that. She's so afraid of people pushing her away that she pushes them away first. Then she builds up the courage to enter the classroom. As soon as Yuri enters the classroom, she stammers as words get caught in her throat. <coughs> <sighs> She realizes that Sayori spent her afternoon reading more of the book and taking notes. She was afraid of Yuri being disappointed in her, so she tried really hard to show her dedication. But before she can continue, Yuri tells her to stop, and that she can't take it. Her anxiety shifts to despair, and her emotions begin to spill from the bottle they've been forced into. She apologizes over and over, pressing her fists against her forehead. When Yuri begins trying to communicate her feelings, she says that she just wants to be treated like a normal person, but Sayori ensures her that she isn't treating her any differently. She wants her friends to be happy, and she thought that if she did something that Yuri liked, then they could become closer, but Yuri cuts her off. I don't want your pity! Yuri breaks down and sinks to her knees. Her mind pounds with internal accusations as she shuts her eyes, unable to face the world. A million thoughts per minute about the assumed consequences of her emotional breakdown. Suddenly, Yuri feels Sayori wrap her arms around her from behind, telling her that everything is going to be okay. He tells Yuri, I understand the things you're feeling in your head are different from the things you're trying to say. I know that must be what you're feeling right now. I promise, I understand that. So I'll give you as much time as you need. Yuri steadies her voice as she prepares herself to talk. I think that I've gotten so used to people being weirded out by me, that it feels like anyone who's nice to me is just doing it out of pity. I'm so horrible with people, so it makes me not want to believe that someone can actually like me for who I am. I got so excited when I joined the literature club. I thought that it was finally my chance to make friends through my interests, because my interests are the only things I know how to talk about. It's all I have going for me. But then, whenever I catch myself getting overly obsessive in front of other people, it feels like I'm making a fool of myself. I hate myself for it. Ultimately, I just want to be treated like a normal person. But how am I supposed to expect that when I can't behave like one? I just want to learn how to get along with people and stop ruining things for myself. That's all. Yuri finishes her thoughts, feeling more steady after having gotten them out. Sometimes it can be really helpful to process your emotions with other people. What I really want all of us to take away from this is that constantly bottling your emotions means that they're eventually going to spill out. With too much pressure, you'll start to see cracks in that bottle, and eventually, it shatters. Those cracks, they're symbolized by those emotional outbursts and unhealthy coping mechanisms, which we'll get into now. But before we do, I'd like to once again reiterate that I'm not an expert. I'm not a psychologist, and I'm not a social worker. What I say is simply based on my understanding of these topics, using sources to check myself and educate myself along with you guys. These are touchy topics, and for people who are struggling with the issues I'm about to talk about, there are resources in the description below to help. That touchy topic in question that we're about to get into is self-harm. I believe that this is the coping mechanism Yuri uses because her emotions are too overwhelming for her. We know that she does this, it isn't speculation. Monica tells us that Yuri cuts herself as some sort of sexual thing. And while I can't say that it doesn't play into it at all, given everything we've talked about so far and the details I'll be discussing now, I don't think it's the main reason behind the self-harm. It's just that those sexual feelings compound with all her other ones too. And it definitely becomes a plot point in the main game because she's so attracted to the protagonist. Regardless, I think Monica is mentioning it because it makes Yuri look less desirable in the player's eyes. Though that's just my take. You could say that those sexual feelings would be a part of the thing she doesn't know how to process. Especially in Act 2 of DDL. And Monica makes her much more obsessive, therefore heightening those feelings. There are details speckled within the game that demonstrate what I'm saying, starting with The Raccoon, the second poem presented to us by Yuri. I've heard some players take this poem as her writing about you, the player, but let's keep our minds open for another interpretation. The first couple of lines describe when she was home at night, thinking about self-harm, likely due to her going through with it in the past. It was this urge that she was distracted by, aka the raccoon, that made her realize she's an unordinary human. 
In the next couple of lines, she cuts herself, realizing that she's feeding into the urge to self-harm when she feels the need to. When she sees her knife, the follow-through becomes easier, which is likely why she carries them with her every day, as Monica mentioned. She likely wouldn't be carrying it around with her all day if it hadn't already gotten to this point, and she clearly knows that. I think this feeds into her quote-unquote, unordinary interests. The final stanza solidifies the idea that she's conditioned herself to self-harm whenever she feels the urge to. That's what the classic Pavlovian conditioning term is referring to. And I'm sure some of you have heard this one. There was a girl who every time she felt happy would click a counter that was kept in her pocket. Over time, this behavior became ingrained in her mind, body, and soul. Eventually, it got to the point where if she needed to feel happy, she would click it. She conditioned herself to associate the feeling of happiness with the clicking noise. You can also see this in animals. For example, you can train a dog to come and eat by ringing a bell in the same manner. They learn that the bell is associated with eating and so they adjust their behavior accordingly. Or when they need to use the bathroom, they can go over and ring the bell which is conveniently attached to that door. They've been conditioned to hit the bell when they need to, to serve a purpose. Using this logic, we can see that Yuri is describing the same thing in her poem. She's the raccoon. The next detail shows up when Yuri comes over to your house on Sunday, assuming you chose her of course. Shortly into her visit with us, Yuri reaches into her bag and pulls out an intricately designed pocket knife in order to cut some ribbon, much to our surprise. After being asked if we want to handle it, we end up cutting ourselves by accident as we touch the tip of the knife to our finger. Yeah, real smart. Yuri begins to exhibit some weird behavior, mainly fidgeting at the sight of the blood, and proceeds to insert our finger into her mouth and starts to lick it before pulling away nervously. Finger licking good. Shortly after returning to working on and finishing the door decorations, Yuri asks us to get cups for the watercolor paint tablets ready since we'll be painting a banner for the festival. When we come back into the room, we see Yuri unrolling her sleeve quickly. By this point, your brain should be subconsciously putting together the puzzle pieces. We know that Yuri uses self-harm as a way to process her emotions, and with that, we can assume that she might be trying to calm herself down as she's excited to be with us in the first place, but doesn't know how to show so much emotion as it's only gotten her into trouble in the past, like we discussed earlier. Now we'll get into Act 2. From this point on, we're given direct confirmation that she does self-harm. I'd just like to make sure we understand that it's still an unhealthy coping mechanism for processing feelings. Those feelings are even more heightened now, with Monica messing with the game files and making it much harder for Yuri to be able to control herself. Unfortunately, sometimes when people find it hard to control themselves, the only way they feel they can get that control back is by self-harming, one of the few things they feel they have control over. Considering what Monica has done at this point in the game, we can understand why it might be happening more in conjunction with everything else we've gone over. First, there's the time when we're about to read with Yuri, and she goes up to fill a water pitcher to make tea. Before leaving, it seems like she has a lot of energy and is more excited than usual to spend time with us. Then she apologizes and says she needs to find a way to calm herself down. When she's been gone for 10 minutes, we realize that something's gone wrong, and go out to the hallway to look for her, only to find her hurting herself. When she comes back from getting the water, she seems to be in a better mood. She says she's been trying to express her emotions a little bit more, and that it's easier to do that when we're around. But with what we've established, I think we know how she calmed herself down. And then, there's of course, when she hurts herself for the final time as her emotions come to a boiling point. After confessing her love to us, no matter how we answer, the bottle shatters as she stabs herself to death, overwhelmed with the emotions she could no longer contain. A loss of control. A loss of a life. I can't say I have the solutions, but talking about these issues is something that's super important to me. I think the most we can do to help other people and ourselves is to educate ourselves on the reasons these things might happen. With that, we can learn to recognize those patterns. It all starts with an open mind and an open heart. We can use resources to find the best ways of helping people through their negative thought patterns and encourage them to get help. What happened with Yuri is unfortunate to say the least, and it wasn't helped at all by Monica's tampering. But these same things reflect what people go through here in our reality every day, from the anxiety stemming from being bullied and socially excluded, slowly growing into masking in social situations and burrowing what you feel inside, and then finally blossoming into the inability to process those feelings. 
and relying on unhealthy coping mechanisms. That mentality is like a weed, spreading and corroding the other parts of your body and mind. The only thing we can do is uproot that infectious weed and plant a new seed that will eventually blossom into a beautiful flower garden. It might take a while to find all those roots, but over time, I promise that it's possible. Before I go, I'd like to read one final poem given to us from Yuri. One that we're rewarded with for spending the most time with her in the club. My conductor motions for one crescendo after the next, each time falling short of a climax. The lump in my throat is carried by Sisyphus. How many words must I choose not to say before they finally break loose, orderlessly piling out of my mouth like a flock of school children at the start of recess? Pen cannot be erased. But even that metaphor fails comically as my floor is littered, blanketed with wasted paper. A canvas of my mind, full of disjointed thoughts and unfinished sentences. Perhaps, all along, it was wrong to try forcing them out of my room. And I should instead invite you in. Hey, thank you so much for watching. If you did like this video, then show me you liked it by uh, liking it <laughs> and subscribing too if you'd like. I have videos on the other Dokis and a lot more to come too, so I think you'll enjoy that. And of course, big shout outs to anyone who supports me on Patreon. Wouldn't be able to do it without you guys. And like I said, this art was made by members of my Discord community, so huge shout outs to them too. You're very welcome to join. Thank you to Team Salvato and Serenity Forge for bringing this game to us and have a fantastic day.